Stan is a, a rare breed now. He's um, a member of, he was a member of number 490, 490s squadron, um, which was uh, a New Zealand uh, Catalina and Sunderland squadron in, uh, in uh, West Africa during World War II. And uh, there's not many people around these days like Stan, so it's a, a real pleasure to have him here. Not many around like me. We're all unique anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but Cliff Tate is a hard act to follow. <laughs> My first contact with RNZAF was in 1940. That was the year I turned 18. That qualified me for compulsory military service in those days. I know you don't remember them. <laughs> so I put in an application because I didn't want to serve in the army, I wanted to fly. I put in an application form, uh, for a form and filled it out. Air crew was voluntary and under 21 any applicant had to have parents okay. I started a language degree after five years at Mount Upper Grammar in 1940 and my old man said I was in the army in the First World War and he was. 1914 he went to UK in New Zealand forces even though he was born in Bolton in Lancashire. He said, you get back to university. I did my bit. So, I put the application form back in the drawer and waited for my call-up. I waited another year, almost two years. My call-up came for December the 1st, 41. Students at university and teachers college didn't have to do their three months compulsory military training uh, immediately after their 18th uh, year birthday. We were allowed to postpone until December so that the uh, studies weren't interrupted. So I reported for the 1st of December 1941 to Avondale Racecourse which had been converted into an army camp. After a few days of course along came December 7. You all remember? Pearl Harbor. The Japs had attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and did a lot of damage sank a number of their big ships. That meant that we were more committed inevitably. On parade on the morning of December the 8th we were told you are now in the army not for three months training but for the duration of the war. I have to get out of this. So that night I jumped the fence, went AWOL, pretty serious in the army. At living in Mount Albert I got home okay, told the old man the story and he agreed that he should sign. Promised to set to post the application form away and I found my way back over the fence. It took 11 months for my transfer to come through. I was in the first Orcs, Hillcrest, and we swapped with the Hauraki's at Greedon Racecourse uh, for the third nib manoeuvres and things like that. 
and I happened to be on the rifle range in Papamoa. Very different Papamoa in those days. When the Don R, the dispatch rider, came along in his boat bike with an instruction that Private Walker had to return to headquarters in Greer. My transfer to Air Force had come through. Off I went, finished up at Waipapa Kauri in the ADU, the Airdrome Defence Unit. We were defending there the Coastal Command aircraft of New Zealand. Vickers Vincent and Wildebeest of First World War. We used to watch them doing their vertical takeoffs. They were the first vertical takeoff aircraft that I saw. A good steady breeze off the 90 mile beach and a Vincent or a Ville de Beach would just go up like that. <laughs> and same coming back. <laughs> there we did this guard duty and as well as that we were working our way through the 21 assignments, mainly maths and navigation and so on. Until we did that, we couldn't get to Rotorua, ITW, the initial training wing. Finally, after about four months up at the YPAP, um, I was in Rotorua. There they tested you in all sorts of ways, physical, mental, etc., and decided whether you were going to be a pilot, a navigator, a wireless operator, or an air gunner. Well, I managed the pilot, and unfortunately, I, they chose that uh, they saw that I could not make a fighter pilot. I was more bomber type, and so I was uh, headed for twin engine training. Then the fingers were crossed. Now I'll get ahead of myself. Pardon me if I I need a battery, <laughs> and uh, every now and then things go all right. All right. Uh, I almost forgot the tiger moth. How the hell would I forget the tiger moth? <laughs> After having all these tests, we were sent to various places in New Zealand and I ended up in Ashburton. Middle of winter, snow on the ground. I've got a photo of me with my cap and my leather jacket and so on, necessary in that tiger moth cockpit. Loved flying the Tiger, of course, in Ashburton. Did the course successfully. And in October 1943, I was, along with others, sent to Wellington, and the New Amsterdam was to take us to Canada. The fingers crossed bit that I mentioned was that half the graduates of that elementary flying would stay in New Zealand and serve, do their training and serve in the Pacific. There were not many volunteers for that. We all wanted to go to Canada and UK, of course, and I was lucky. So off we go to Canada. I finish up at number 12 SFTS, Service Flying Training School, in Brandon, Manitoba, right in the middle of the Canadian prairies. Snow on the ground in October. I left in April. Still snow on the ground. The whole winter. A long one. But the course was interesting. We flew Cessna Crane. A beauty to fly. Overpowered. It was the, the same aircraft given a new name. It was the Cessna Bobcat. And it was built for four <coughs> passengers and luggage uh, for a short haul around Canada and the States. So uh, with these 
two huge Jacobs engines, we had a lot of fun. Wing Commander takeoffs and things of that style. Lots of fun in formation flying, that sort of thing. And I had a lovely uh, sergeant instructor, Sergeant Deal Doll. He'd been up to warrant officer every now and then and back to sergeant. Bit of a bad lad. <laughs> <laughs> I missed out badly here. Uh, he had a girlfriend in North Dakota. And uh, I think he had three of us as pupil pilots. And unfortunately it wasn't on one of my flights with him that the map blew out the window. And he lot got lost. And he and his uh, pupil pilot ended up in a town in North Dakota for a weekend. So he didn't go below sergeant. They couldn't put him back to corporal, but he didn't go up <laughs> either. Quite a character. Anyway, we come to the end of that course. And so we are looking to England. Beyond the amount of time before we there were 43 Kiwis on that course, and we were then looking forward to going to Montreal, the reception centre and dispatch, and over to UK. But suddenly, on the notice board appear four names: Walker, Miller, Jensen. Davies, posted to number one GR school, Summerside, Prince Edward Island. What the hell is going on? We made inquiries. We were the top four in the course and we'd been posted to Coastal Command. Coastal Command pilots, I did learned, were required to do a navigator's ticket. Long flights over the water were likely, and only one navigator in the crew. So, sensible policy, uh, someone had to back up the navigator. And they decided that all pilots would do that training. So off went my 39 friends to UK and the four of us went down to Prince Edward Island for a three month course for a navigator's ticket. The normal navigator's course in Canada was seven months. We were required to do it in three. We were bright boys, you see. We did a lot of overtime. One of the many things was learning ship recognition for all the ships of the seven major navies. They all looked alike to be. Anyway, we got through that all right. Down to Halifax, on a trip to New York, by the way, we had a, a week's leave from Montreal, and Ken Jensen and I decided we'd go to New York. Had a wonderful time there. Uh, some of you may have heard of the New Zealand Forces Club, set up by Nolan Luxford, uh, daughter of a, a justice of ours, uh, and a quite successful little actress, a bit in Hollywood and also New York. With the help of people she'd known, got to know in New York, she set up the New Zealand Forces Club. And so when we moved in, we'd heard all about it. You were given accommodation. I remember visiting a millionaire's uh, pad overlooking Central Park uh, for a meal, the odd meal. You could pick up at the office free tickets for every show in town. And we did that. I saw the original Oklahoma, uh, Arsenic and Old Lace, the, the moment for me though was an Othello 
I was very disappointed actually. This was June, very warm. We were, we had to wear the full uniform and we ducked into every uh, building that had air conditioning to cool off a little bit. But the uh, I'm getting lost now. Hello. The uh, Othello. Oh yes, my disappointment. June, midsummer, too warm. I wanted to see two things: Met Opera, the Metropolitan Opera in New York, world famous, and Porgy and Bess, which had just got started. They were both closed because it was midsummer and too hot. But I, that was made up by these other shows we saw, and for me particularly, and Othello in the Schubert Theatre in New York, a little uh, beautiful little theatre. Othello played by Paul Robeson, some of you have heard of him, glorious singer and a tremendous voice, spoken voice. A big man, Negro of course, and did Othello perfectly, the first Negro to play the part. The villain, Iago, who can steal the play, was played by a fellow I'd never heard of, Jose Ferrer. He didn't make films until after the war. Became very well known. Okay. Digest, digression to New York, back to Montreal, down to Halifax for a trip to UK, and it's the New Amsterdam again. Good boat, flagship of the uh, Dutch lines, 35,000 tonner I think, big in those days, too fast for uh, convoy, so she was an IRMV, independently routed uh, motor vessel. Went independent of uh, convoy, obviously. So with her, we went into Greenwich on the Clyde, uh, down to Padgate. The usual reception centre in the UK was Bristol on the southern coast, but that was a favourite target of German aircraft, uh, that area of Britain, the south and the southeast. So they moved us to Padgate, a little place in Lancashire, an old whatever it had been, I don't know, but old barracks, and there we were for over a month. But it's in Lancashire, and not far off Bolton, my dad's old home, and though I caught up with his family on my leaves. My postage came to South Cerny in Gloucestershire for the AFU, a five month course, advanced flying, and here I met the Airspeed Oxford. I don't know how many times we were warned, but over and over again. You blokes from Canada, for God's sake, don't try to do in the Oxford what you got away with in the Cessna. The Cessna, as I told you, was overpowered. The Oxford, if anything, was underpowered and had a vicious stall, a spin you could never get out of and there had been a lot of fatalities. So I was cautious, but uh, still enjoyed uh, getting around England. Breaking the rules, my dad had, in the First World War, only got as far as Lark Hill Camp, sometimes called Sling, uh, on Canterbury Plains. And I remember one morning, well on in the course, Early-ish, uh, nice day, I'll go and have a look at Salisbury Plain. We were not supposed to go outside our uh, area, mainly because of 
uh, radio uh, coverage as I went over. Unfortunately, there was a fair fog on Salisbury Plain and uh, you couldn't get in. You could only see through if you were looking straight down. Well, to find uh, any spot on the plane was pretty well impossible. I just about given up when I saw something sticking up through the fog. Salisbury Cathedral spire. <laughs> so that was on the map. So I got over Lark Hill, and that's where my old man had been from 1914 to 17. The end of that course waiting for a posting and suddenly I find that I'm sent to 490 Squadron in Sierra Leone. A New Zealand Squadron in Sierra Leone. Why? We all know about the Atlantic convoys particularly taking supplies from the States and Canada to UK. UK there stuck on her own and needing a hell of a lot of help. It was 1943 before the Jerry woke up to the fact that a lot of supplies were coming from New Zealand, Australia, India, South Africa, and all these ships had to come up the west coast of Africa to get the supplies to UK. So they started sending U-boats down, particularly to sit off the Cape of Good Hope, because all those ships had to turn that corner. The response to that was, along with uh, Wellingtons, Wimpies, um, Liberators and so on, the land-based aircraft in Bathurst and other places like that, uh, they sent four squadrons, or they set up four squadrons of originally uh, Catalinas and later uh, Sutherlands. The northernmost one was in Dakar in Senegal, that was flown by the Free French. In Freetown, we were two squadrons, an RAF squadron and 490 New Zealand. And round the corner in Lagos, Nigeria, was another RAF squadron. So there were four Sunderland squadrons. Uh, to patrol that uh, west coast, our part of it. The Sunderland four engines, Bristol Pegasus, we were Mark III Sunderlands. No Bristol Pegasus engine had been built since 1940, and this was 1945. So reconditioned motors, we were lucky to get back with four still running. Later on in the course, one crew was sent back to UK 